Don't forget to mute. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate this team. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Linda. Hey, Scott, will you go ahead and, and um, turn your video off, too, please? You want mine on, though, right? Uh, Mary, you stay on. We <laughs> need you. Okay. We lost Julie. Hey, Tom, when Julie come, there we, there we go. Okay. Mary, you ready? I'm ready, ma'am. All right. Thanks, Miss Linda. I'm looking forward to it. Uh -huh. And feel free Ooh. if you need anything while we're going, just to tell me, okay? I'm going to grab a cushion for my chair. <clears throat> Linda, don't forget when you start the webinar, it's going to take a while for everybody to get in. So give them a little time, okay? Absolutely. Thanks, Tom. Hey, Tom, can you start yes. a text Start a text train with our co-host, please, for me? Oh, that would be okay. great. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Okay, Mary, here we go. We're going to take just a moment to allow everyone to uh, get in the room. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Hey. Good morning. My name is Linda O'Connor. I'm the president of C3, the Caring Community Collaborative, and I have the honor today to serve as your moderator. Thank you for joining us today for the first session of our conference. You can find more information on this conference and about C3's work on our website, www.c3ohio.org. I'd like to thank our sponsors for this venture, the Butler County Mental Health and Addiction Recovery Services Board, and the Butler County Family and Children First Council. Thank you also to our community partners, the Lakota Local School District, and Envision Partnerships for their continued support. I also want to thank a terrific team of volunteers for all of their work putting together today's event. Some housekeeping details before we begin. If you're joining us by phone, please take just a moment Put your name in the chat box. We'd love to know who's with us today. Throughout this webinar, attendees will not be visible or audible, and we look forward to your participation through your questions and your comments. Please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen for questions. We'll take a moment periodically throughout our discussion to address them. The chat box is also available for questions and comments. If you could take a moment just now to open your chat box up and make sure that you've set your comments to go to everyone. I've also asked our speaker and team to put their contact information in the chat box just in case you have follow-up questions or comments for them. To our attendees that are applying for professional CEUs today, your time in and out of the conference is automatically recorded. Please address any questions that you might have to Joanna Lawry regarding CEUs and her information is already in the chat box. Also note for the CEU certification, there'll be a very brief survey as you leave the meeting today. You'll need to complete that after each of our sessions. Let's get to the good part. Mary Vicario is our first speaker today and she is the founder of Finding Hope Consulting. She's a certified trauma specialist. She holds a certificate in traumatic studies from the Child Trauma Center at the Justice Resource Institute. She has over 30 years of experience working with survivors and she's turned the latest research into intervention for all ages and abilities. Mary's had some interesting experiences, which I think she'll be sharing with us today. She was an American Counseling Association delegate to China and Mongolia. 
She participated in a conference on human trafficking, and she's guest lectured at universities in Germany. She received training at international trauma conferences and at Harvard Medical School. She's a trainer for Ch Ohio Child Welfare. She's co-authored a number of articles and guides and textbook chapters. I think she'll be talking about that as well. Yeah. Mary's honored to provide trauma responsive certification through the Tri-State Trauma Network for anyone working with trauma survivors. Mary, the floor is yours and we're looking forward to our discussion today. Thank you, thank you for having me. Um, 3C and all of the other people who are putting this on today. So happy to be here and thank you everyone who's in attendance today. Wow, what a great crowd we have. So today I would love for us to look at, um, here we go, fighting this invisible enemy. How do we build resilience in those we serve and in ourselves during this difficult time of COVID-19? So a little success for our time together. I'm going to make a couple of suggestions. First of all, um, if there's a virtual hack, just exit the meeting and um, our webmaster, Tom, will take care of everything and probably send out a new link. It's only happened to me once, so I think we're gonna be good. Um, you don't have to mute your mic because yours is already muted. I think the most important are these last four here. I'm inviting you today to approach what I have to say with curiosity, because curiosity is going to engage your thinking brain. Certainty engages your fear center. So I'm inviting you to be brave and lean into things that get your attention and things that you're like, I'm not so sure about. I'm inviting you to lean out instead of shutting it out. And then we're doing all of this because we want to honor the gifts of all the different people who are coming um, to this presentation today and all the different work. And you can honor someone's work and someone's ideas without having to agree with it. I often think of this as that proverb where there's a group of blind men and they're all holding a different part of the elephant. And one man is holding the tail and he's like, wow, elephants are thin and tiny like worms. And another part's holding the trunk, another man. And he's saying, are you kidding me? They're big like snakes. And another part's like, I don't know what you're talking about. They're solid like a wall. That man has his hand on the side. Another one thinks they're like a tree trunk. Another one thinks elephants are like a leaf. But it's not until we put all of those perspectives together that we get the whole elephant. So everyone here is unique and important and we all have something to contribute. So I'm inviting us throughout your entire day today to lean in and lean out. This is a quote that I found very comforting during this time of COVID and I think I'll probably carry it with me throughout my life. It tells us that endurance does not come from hope alone. It begins with knowing and having the courage to face and accept the reality of the ground upon which we stand. Survival comes from balancing reality with optimism and hope, which is one of the things I find so exciting about this conference because it's about ACEs, which we have to have the courage to face and accept the, the reality of the ground upon which we stand, which is frequently adverse childhood experiences or compounding adverse toxic stressors, ACEs and CATS, but we don't stop there. We balance that with optimism and hope because you never look at ACEs without looking at resilience. It's like having a coin that's only printed on one side. So today, the people putting this together, 3C and all of their sponsors have brought together, not just the information about the reality upon which we stand, but what we can do about it. So the first question that you're gonna to get to answer in your chat is what gives you a sense of hope? So think about it, what's kept you going through this COVID-19 time, which we're you know, fast approaching on the one year date of when everything shut down. What kept you going and what just keeps you going in general? What gives you a sense of hope? And I know we have people who will read the chat whenever you all 
are ready to share in it. Mary, we have a terrific balance, all different organizations today, 179 participants, and some of the comments that they've made in terms of what gives them hope, my kids, oh, yes. things always change, Yes. my family, family and a future vacation on the beach, which sounds pretty good right yes. now, um, family over and over again, a willingness of organizations to grow, to learn, to serve children, spiritual relationship, mm -hmm. enjoying life. I love this one, celebrating small things. Yes. Thinking about the future, the little joys of life, family, faith. Uh, and maybe the one that captures it the most is this too shall pass. Oh. Mm -hmm. Kids' resilience, connections with safe people. Mm, yes. Sun coming through the window, family, and springtime. Yes. Spring, I think that's, that's a lot of encouragement there. Yes, it is. Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Linda, for reminding me that we have a poll to find out who is with us today. So I'm going to ask Ms. Lori to uh, get the poll started for us. Thank you for that reminder. So we have a poll in front of us. If you'll take a moment, we will have that open for 30 seconds. And the question is, what setting do you work in? So please go ahead and input your answers. And if you fall under other, feel free to put into the chat what your other is. Okay, Mary, can you see that poll? Yes, it looks like we have 29% um, of us work in the schools, great. And 19% in outpatient mental health, that's where I started and I started it in Butler County in the 1980s. Residential and inpatient mental health, yes. Substance abuse and dependence, mm -hmm. criminal justice, and we have a parent with us and um, a bunch of other. We have 44% other, it's our largest group. So it'll be great to find out who some of those others are. And hopefully I will be able to adapt what I'm saying and say, this is what this could look like in a classroom. This is what it might look like in a mental health setting that's outpatient. This is what it might look like in a residential center. This is what it might look like in a justice center or in a home so that we can um, see how this applies in a variety of ways. And if you have ideas on how it can apply to your area, please put that in the chat as well. Okay, so I wanna look at these objectives. And if anyone knows me, I always wanna make sure you have a host of information and activities when you leave here. So um, I might not get through all the slides, but I have a code embedded in the slides. So. Our first objective is to identify COVID's impact on the fear cascade. So we're gonna look at what is the fear cascade and how has COVID affected it. But you will see on the second, third, and fourth interventions that I have a little symbol there of the people talking. This, when this shows up on the slide, this is an intervention. So that means anything I talk about on that slide is something that you can use with yourself, with someone you serve, with someone you love, it's an intervention because frequently I bury the interventions in the story about the interventions and then people are like, yeah, but we didn't get any interventions. So the procedural steps of the intervention will show up on the slide and this is how you'll know this is an intervention. And so we'll have interventions that are resilience based um, to help all of us regulate through COVID, to help enhance our relationships, um, not only through COVID, but going forward and how do we lead people along the cliffs of safety, which of course is the other side of that fear cascade. And we'll be looking at all that today. So looking at our first two, identifying COVID's impact on the fear cascade and some resilience-based interventions we can use to assist ourselves, those we serve and those we love. 
And it all begins with something called felt safety. What is it and why does it matter? Well, felt safety is very different than actual safety. Felt safety is what we feel in our body, those cues you get. You know, do you ever get on an elevator and you get this creepy feeling? Yeah, that's your vagus nerve, which we're going to talk about in a second, just saying, mm, I'm not sure I feel so safe in here. Um, and felt safety is also comes in when you're feeling comfortable with people and you get to relax. Many people say, oh man, I get to be myself with this group of people. Ah, that's a sense of felt safety. And this felt safety literally is the cornerstone of our ability as humans to connect and regulate. And this is the same across the board for all humans. Our, the cornerstone of our ability to connect with one another and keep ourselves calm and safe and those around us calm and safe is a sense of felt safety. So- Mary, could, may I ask a question there? Oh, please, yes. So when you're talking about felt safety, would you also say that's your gut, your gut reaction or your instinct or your um, intuition? Yes, that, that all comes, we now know, scientifically we know that that comes from your vagus nerve. Yes, thank you, that's- Thank you. You're welcome. So one of the things that the pandemic has done has moved us way down on the um, hierarchy of needs. We are not up here in self-actualization right now. <laughs> Probably not even, we're trying to be here, but really where we are is basic physiological safety needs because we're still working very hard to protect our health and that puts us down here. And that's okay, but just like the opening quote, it's important to know the ground upon which we stand. Please know that your gut is working on this level. Thank you, Ms. Linda, for that. So how do we survive this time in between? And I saw someone on the news last night. He said, um, it was a baseball analogy. He goes, I know we all wish we were at the bottom of the eighth, but I think we're at the beginning of the seventh inning. And so um, we're still in that time in between. We're not quite sure exactly when this will end and what things will look like when they end. And our fear center in our brain does not like not knowing exactly where we are and exactly what's coming. So what can we do about that? Well, one of the things our fear center does like is stress that has a clear beginning, middle, and end. And what's so great about our brain is that whenever we notice anything that has a clear beginning, middle, and end, doesn't even have to be something stressful. It calms our fear center. So I jokingly say, although I actually do it every single night, I jog on the trampoline and I watch um, NCIS or some other show where at the end, a criminal goes to jail because it's very calming to my brain. Unlike the work I do, these shows have a very clear beginning, middle and end. And in fact, I can usually guess who the killer is by where they show up in the show because it, it's fascinating. They have a pattern to that too. I think they're actually called procedurals if you're a writer because they follow a certain procedure, but they're very calming. They can be very calming to the brain, but so can anything that has a clear beginning, middle and end. So one of my first offers to you today is that as you go throughout this time in between, notice the beginning, middle and end of anything. Is it a story you're reading? Is it this, your schedule? looking at your schedule at the beginning of the day, say, this is what my morning's gonna look like, this is gonna be my lunch, this is gonna be my afternoon or my evening or my close of my day. Your brain is going to find that very calming. And we can do that with the people we serve as well. It's kind of the power behind visual schedules. It's part of the power behind visual schedules is that the brain gets to see a clear beginning, middle and end to a day. So we're gonna do some quick writes today and you can do these in the chat. You can do them personally, whatever's the most comfortable. So another thing I want us to look at is the solid ground upon which we do stand. And that is the knowing of what brought you to this work and what keeps you in this work. So there's something that brought you here and there's something that keeps you here. It might be the same thing, it might be different, and that doesn't matter. But what matters is that we take a time to notice that, because that's the ground upon which we stand. 
and that's going to be very calming for all of us. So just take a minute and think about what brought you here, what keeps you here. And if you're comfortable sharing in the chat, that would be lovely. So Mary, I have a couple of questions while we're waiting for that. Sure. I've been asked if it would be okay to share your slides with our attendees today. Yes, I thought I sent them. So Okay, so we will, we will send that out afterwards to everyone so they oh, don't need to yes. worry about taking notes. Yes, 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 the, definitely. And I can even put them in the chat if that's helpful at some point. Someone will okay. walk me through how to do that. <laughs> we can do it either way. Okay. Uh, we have a comment. We have a comment in our Q&A, life has an ending that can be unsettling. Yes. Yes. And, and in our chat room, uh, we have a lot of comments responding back. So I'll just pick a few of them if that's okay. Yes. And thanks everybody for remembering to share with everyone. So there's some great stuff here. Great. Uh, continuing to be able to work with the families that I do, knowing that I could have it a lot worse and that I am here for a reason. And if I'm still here, then I'm still here to work toward achieving <sighs> what I am doing. Mm -hmm. um, So what I knowing, go ahead. Knowing <clears throat> I'm scrolling down because I also have um, people commenting on what agencies are with as well, which is great. Oh, wow. So care management support to families in eight counties, Head Start, Lighthouse Youth Services, oh, uh, Department of Developmental Disabilities, yes. Foster Parents Youth Serving Organizations, yes. uh, school members. Family advocate, it, it, the list is just amazing. Oh, that gives me chills. It, and it's really neat. And, and one of our comments from people was purpose. And you just named so many different purposes by naming those organizations. Yes, our purpose is very calming to us. And it is very true that part of the ground upon which we set, stand is that life has an end. And knowing that is very unsettling to humans. And so purpose is one of the ways the researchers found that that unsettling reality cannot get in the way as much of our daily living so that we can live more fully. I also find Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, her work very beautiful, but also very clear because those stages of grief are like that beginning, middle, and end. And even though you don't go through them just one direction, you go back and forth through them. Literally having those toe holds to say, oh, I just went back to bargaining, or whoops, I'm back in the anger piece. Oh, I got a little acceptance out of this. Just knowing where those toe holds are on the mountain that you're climbing as you're dealing with the overwhelming grief, especially in this COVID time when we've lost so many people or so many people's lives have been changed. That is another way to get to that beginning, middle and end, giving yourself a toehold and just noticing where you are. Once again, noticing with curiosity, not saying, oh, I shouldn't be in anger, I should be here. That's gonna stress you out. Just notice where you are, you're there for a reason and that's okay. Just like you're here for a reason, doing this work for a reason. So as you notice, I've already started talking with my hands. I'm Italian, it's what I do. And so I'd love to use Dan Siegel's hand brain because it allows me to talk with my hands and talk about the brain at the same time. Thank you, Dan Siegel. So if your hand was brain, between your wrist and your elbow is your um, spinal column, but coming off of it is something I've mentioned once already. The name is not important, but the name is vagus nerve. What is important is it gives us that sense of felt safety. And I love how Linda said, oh, is that your gut feeling? And what's so powerful about that question and about that language is that our vagus nerve literally connects to every organ in our body. So it truly does give us a feeling in our gut or a feeling somewhere else in our body. And the research has shown that when we can slow down and notice where in our body we feel our feelings, 
we can actually do more with those feelings than when we just think about them in words. So today our goal is going to be to coordinate all parts of our brain all the way down to this vagus nerve. And this vagus nerve comes online at 23 weeks gestation and it starts recording memory there as body sensation only. So Peter Levine has some wonderful work on how we can help people have some very early pre-verbal memories that just live as feelings in their body. And I'm gonna give us some things that anyone can do. You don't have to be a therapist to do anything I'm giving you. You can be a therapist and take it to that next level, that therapeutic level, but I like to give interventions that anyone can do. So that's our vagus nerve running all the way down through every organ in our body. Then, the next part is our brain stem. And our brain stem is gonna be represented by the palm of our hand. It's in charge of everything we don't wanna to have to think about. You know what? I have slides for these. There's a picture of your vagus nerve, by the way, wrapping around all your organs. Ah, we're gonna back up before we go to the brain stem. We're gonna actually do an activity with our vagus nerve. So this is an activity that I adapted from um, my grandmother's hands, which is a book by Resma McKenna. And what I love about his book is that he invites all of us in with vagus nerve activities, but he calls the vagus nerve the soul nerve because it's what you feel in your body. It's your gut, it's your soul nerve. And I just think that's so beautiful. Now he does these, they're designed to help you get to your pain and your resilience. On a training, my goal is not to take you into your pain today, it's to take you into your resilience. So I adapt his work whenever I use it in training so that we focus on what's the calming and resilience-based piece of this. But this book's really excellent. And if you're a therapist, he has some wonderful vagus nerve activities that you can use with your clients and then take to the next level. So today, we're going to just get comfortable in our seats. You don't have to close your eyes for this. And just take a moment and look around the room where you are. Notice where you are. Our vagus nerve loves it when we notice boundaries. So notice the ceiling. Notice the floor. Notice where the walls meet the ceiling the walls meet the floor. If you're blessed to be someplace beautiful and outdoors, notice where the sidewalk is. Notice where the grass meets the sidewalk. See if you can notice the horizon, where the sky and the land meet. All of that's very calming. Our vagus nerve also loves to know what's behind us. So we're gonna take a moment and just twist around and notice what's behind you. Our vagus nerve loves knowing where there's exits. So notice the windows where you are. And if you're in a place that doesn't have windows, you definitely have a door because you got in through the door. Notice the door as well. Some of us are in rooms that have doors to the outside. Some of us have doors to another part of the building we're in. So that's a quick something that we all can do every day when we're stressed, is just take a moment and notice where everything is. Sometimes it helps to notice your favorite color because your favorite color is your favorite color because of the feeling it gives you. And that feeling is connected with positive memories, else it wouldn't be your favorite color. So just noticing, and I do that frequently when I work with people, um, we just stop and I go, oh, let's see how many things we can find with your favorite color. And we point at them. Brain loves that, vagus nerve loves that. So this was our activity for our vagus nerve, our first soul nerve activity of the day. Then the next part of the hand brain is that brain stem I was talking about. And it's in charge of all the things we don't wanna to have to think about like breathing, digestion, bladder and bowel control, heart rate, blood pressure, arousal. And it communicates just like the vagus nerve through body sensations. So it gives you information about what's around you by how you feel in your gut or your chest or your throat, anywhere in your body. It communicates with body sensations. This is the part of your brain that tells you you have to go to the bathroom. 
Think about the last time you were somewhere and you had to go to the bathroom and you couldn't find the bathroom. Didn't that just take over your entire brain? Yes, it did. Because that's the brainstem's job is to connect us with anything related to survival. The next part of our brain is the limbic system. We're going to look at that a lot today because COVID is really impacting this. And that limbic system is in charge of three really important things that spell the word FAR, F-A-R. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's in charge of felt safety, which I sometimes call the fear center. Right here on this little thumb, that's going to go right in the center of your brain. It's also in charge of attachment. Attachment means obviously loving and attaching to people, but it also means the ability to work cooperatively with others. And it also means the ability to have empathy for others. So this is your empathy center. When you hear people say, how do I engage their empathy center? This is literally the part of the brain they're talking about. And then the next part is the regulation part. How do we keep ourselves and others calm in stressful situations? Felt safety, attachment, regulation. That's your the main parts of your limbic system. And when your limbic system gets set off, when the fear center says, oops, something's not right, it's gonna take your thinking brain offline and it's going to direct you to do the following things. The first thing it wants to do is <clears throat> flock, go towards safe others. If it can't do that, then it wants to flee, it wants to get out of here. And if it can't do that, then it'll fight. We only fight in the service of fleeing. What does that mean? We only fight until we can flee. That's the way our brain is designed. Why does that matter? That matters because we have some really, um, we have some games online that make fighting entertainment and they actually do reshape that empathy center of your brain. So that's, that's the bad news. I never get bad news without giving good news. The good news is this is the part of the brain most easily reshaped and most amenable, most able to be regrown. So literally, if you happen to be someone who enjoys those first person shooter games, no judgment here. I'm going to invite you when you're finished though, to think about things you do that make the world a better place, how you've helped someone. Take a moment to notice that because that will reshape your brain for this order of flock, flee, fight. That's coming from your survival center. I mean, your limbic system, my apologies. If the brain thinks you're not going to make it, it takes you out of your limbic system, moves you down to that brain stem, it's brain stem and you're going to freeze or faint or submit. And we'll look more at that on our fear cascade. What does that look like? These parts of the brain I've talked about so far, we don't have conscious control over. And this limbic system communicates through body sensations like the vagus nerve in the brainstem, but it also makes sense of the world and communicates through pictures. And that's going to be important when we look at the next part of the brain. And this is one of that fear cascade that I talked about, and it's broken down because there are safe and unsafe ways we can engage this fear cascade. So there are safe ways to flock, safe relationships, clubs, church, teams, Many of you named them as the things that help you um, get through. Your kids, family, going on vacation with people you love, um, working in an organization that gives you purpose, your spirituality. When you celebrate the small things, who are you celebrating with? And um, having a knowing that this challenge will pass. Where did you get that knowing? Who first gave you that concept? There's a flock, a safe flock hidden in all of those. There's unsafe ways to flock. We can be part of the mean girls club or a gang, or sometimes we get caught up in violent relationships and suicide attempts are an unsafe way to flock. Actually addiction is another unsafe way to flock. And so we're not saying left side bad, right side good. We're saying there are safe and unsafe ways to do this. The good news is if we find ourselves, which we all do at some point, finding ourselves flocking in an unsafe way, irritating people to get attention. I bet many of us work with youth who do that. That's an unsafe way to flock. The beauty is it's telling us they want connection. If we can help them find safe ways to get that connection, we can help them cross 
the fear cascade to what I call the cliffs of safety on the other side. And then what is that fleeing? It can look like running blindly. When your limbic system's in charge, you are running blindly away from something. I see that a lot on my NCIS TV shows. The bad guys often run blindly into the street and get hit by a car or something. But we can change that by helping people have an idea of where they want to run to. Knowing where you want to go to actually helps you flee in a safe way. It's kind of the purpose behind all those goals and objectives we have to do as therapists and it's kind of the purpose of a lesson plan. So you know where you're going toward. It gets your thinking brain online. And if those aren't going to work, then we'll fight. Obviously all forms of aggression are a way of fighting. Suicide attempts you may notice is showing up in all of these, so does addiction. That's the bad news. It's also the good news because that means there's many ways across because it's showing up everywhere. Um, assertiveness is a way to safely fight, exercise, dance, sport, anything that allows your brain to engage while you're doing something active or doing something to help someone else. Advocacy is another powerful way that we fight. And then freeze is down here. It can look like depression. It can look like being stuck. It can look like not protecting children. And I want to talk about that one for a moment. So when I say not protecting children is a freeze response, I'm not saying that's an excuse. I'm saying that's the context. And if we understand that context, it's going to help us address that challenge differently. So when someone is down in their brainstem and we try to guilt them into changing something, we actually drive them further into their brainstem. So we have to find other ways. So one of the ways I've, we've worked with, um, with children's services, and I've actually worked with people in um, residential facilities working um, with addiction. And um, interestingly, when we were in Mongolia, we were invited to, and I quote, help free the people's minds from the shackles of communism. So one of the things we had to do for the parents, because they had lived under a totalitarian regime for so long, was to help them imagine what they wish their life had been like. And that we have also found very helpful for helping parents then be able to engage their empathy center, move up a level, engage their empathy center for themselves. And that allows them to engage for their child and maybe move into this assertive fight position and start to protect their children. We also look at looking oppositional so this can look very oppositional because our fight center gives us a parting gift. If we're going to freeze, it likes to freeze us with our shoulders back, staring right at the person who's frightening us so that we are at least frozen in a threatening position. I was working in uh, actually one of the schools in the Butler County area and LaShonda Sugg was with me. I'm actually wearing one of her t-shirts today um, from Labors of Love. And she had a great relationship with this teacher and a young man had just been completely humiliated in the hallway. The teacher didn't know that. And he gets into class and she's like telling him what she told every other kid in the classroom, John, and she used his name. That's really great. Helps engage the brain. John, I need you to go to your seat, get your books out and then sit there with your hands folded and just breathe. And he just stood there frozen. And she's like, John, I don't need attitude today. John, I just need you to. And she named it again. And the more she talked to him, the more frozen he got. And LaShonda leaned in, as you can only do with someone you have a good relationship with. And she said, is this the hill you want to die on today? Because if it's not, I got something we might want to try. So not only does she say, there's another way to do this, she offers and says, if you're interested, she gives the teacher a choice, really important. We all need choice. And the teacher said, yeah. She goes, how about instead of breathing when he gets to his desk, we all just breathe right now. And breathing goes all the way to the brainstem. He calmed down, his shoulders dropped. He went to his desk. Now he didn't get his stuff out, but he put his head down. And then the teacher could see, her gut kicked in then and could see, oh, something must have happened. 
So there's a variety of ways we can use this. So when you see oppositional defiance, I want you to think free state. I want you to think my brain is processing so slowly, it's on lockdown right now. And if we can just breathe with that person, science, especially if we're within six feet of them, which is outside of swing range, for those of you who work with people who flip from freeze to fight, six feet is outside of swing range. If you can just breathe with them, it'll help their heart and lungs calm as well. There's electrochemical energy that does that. The research is found on a website called heartmath.org, if someone wants to put that in the chat, heartmath.org. Products to help you do that is on the website heartmath.com. So .com products, .org, actual science. But the products are based on the science, so. All right, and then, and yes. Before you, before you go on, <clears throat> we have a few questions for you in the Q&A. Great. Uh, first of all, and I'll combine this into one question, if you could talk a little bit more about how suicide is an unsafe flock and a way of flocking. Yes, yes. So, um, Suicide attempts are an unsafe flock in that one, the person is risking their life to demonstrate their pain to others. When you run out of words, the lower regions of your brain, which are the parts we're talking about right now, take over and they drive you. And when I say drive, I mean the drive as strong as that drive to go to the bathroom and you can't find the bathroom. They will drive you to demonstrate that pain. That's how hardwired we are for connection. So it is a drive. So frequently, and I hope we don't hear this anymore, but when I first started in this field, I would frequently hear, oh, she's just doing it for attention. As my friend Danae likes to say, attention seeking is connection needing. And so I ask that we never ask someone to risk their life to get connection. If someone is hurting themselves, attempting suicide, they are showing us that they need safe connection and they don't have the words or other means to know how to get it. So how do we connect with their pain? Because that will allow us to connect with them which will then hopefully allow them to cross to the other side. And we may have to do this multiple times. Many of the people I work with who are chronically suicidal once lived in a situation where death seemed like the only way out. And unfortunately, that part of the brain that learns that doesn't have a timestamp. So whenever they get caught in stress, their brain goes back to thinking they're in that time. And I don't mean thinking with words, I mean thinking in your gut. They get that gut feeling, it's time for me to die. I have to die, it's the only option I have. So then if we can connect with that and say, hey, let's notice how you helped others th today or last week. Literally anything that helps them remember that they have kept themselves alive till now. And what's helped me do that? Their reasons for living. First, we need to hear their reasons for dying so they don't feel alone in those, but then connect with their reasons for living. And that can help them get across. All of this is about safe connection. And then obviously it's a fleeing from the pain and it's a way to fight back when there's, it feels like there's no other way to stop this pain I'm going to stop this pain by fighting myself. And people who get stuck in that loop can be in a freeze response. And people who have been in literally horrific situations that they could get, not get out of, it can also be a submit response. Was that helpful? It's, it's absolutely fascinating and heartbreaking at the same time that that's the way we react. It's almost, there's an old proverb about um, if you don't listen to the whispers, you're going to hear the screams. Yes. And, and it's that it's that recognition of where this could escalate and how it could escalate that I think you're talking about. Yes, that's that's amazing, Mary. Oh, we have another question: uh, okay. Are the safer cascade responses correlated to resilience factors? Yes, yes, they are. <laughs> Thank you. And you're going to get there, aren't you? I'm going to get there. That's my goal. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. I, I want to make a, a note for our attendees to two more things. We posted the book that Mary referenced in the chat room, and the slide presentation is also in the chat room for your convenience. Oh, so, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mary. Mm -hmm. So 
people who have had to defend themselves by being active, by fleeing or fighting, have a hard time getting into this freeze response, which we need so we can have quiet time. So you can literally sit in your classroom. You need to be able to do this. Um, so that we can have prayer, meditation, but also we need that submit response so we can fall asleep, which is why we call it falling asleep. Because we have to let go of everything and let our brain stem take over. Well, if you have had to go into this submit response, which could be protecting people who have hurt you so they don't hurt you worse. Um, many people, especially young children, when I was in Head Start, I saw this frequently. A child would throw a desk over or they'd go under the desk and curl into a fetal position. Please know that's a, that's a fear response. Um, flopping is something that people on the autistic spectrum often do, um, where they'll just flop. They'll be like dead body weight. And it looks very intentional but it's also a brainstem that has gotten so overwhelmed, it's literally flopped you. It has shut down the rest of your ability to function. So once again, if we can go in with safe connection and even just start with breathing, that can be very helpful. <clears throat> so for our people, this is really helpful, especially for our kids who need recess more than anyone else. And they go out to recess and they come in and they can't calm down and then they lose their recess. They need some help shifting from fighting to the calm they need for the classroom. So find out what are some things that they find calming. In my Catholic school days back in the 1960s, they read to us after school. I can't tell you how many times the Pilgrim's Progress was read to me growing up, showing my age, I'm sure. But that's one way to do it. Um, some yoga stretches, there's some great yoga stuff for kids. Oh my gosh, I've seen some teachers do some really creative stuff in classrooms and I've seen kids actually bring it, bring it home. Um, so there's a variety of ways you can do that. And um, yes, and I put that in purple because we're combining the fight response, which is red, and the freeze response, which is blue. And my friend Prince taught me back in the 1980s that red, hot, and blue makes purple. And I'm told that's true. If you mix red and blue, you get purple. So the brain likes things in pictures. So this was done for me by Karen Boyhen. And this actually shows this same fear cascade in pictures. Are we going to blindly follow people off a cliff? We're going to get together and enjoy each other's company. Are we going to run randomly and put ourselves at risk for falling off the cliff or getting hit by a car? Or are we going to find the trail that leads us to our future or leads us where we want to be? Are we going to fight in a way that's destructive and hurtful? Or are we going to find ways to challenge each other in ways that promote growth and connection or even challenging ourselves? And sometimes, we just hold on for dear life. But whenever possible, if you can get to the hammock and rest instead, that's really helpful to your brain. And sometimes despite our best efforts, that current gets us and takes us downstream. And whenever we can, if we can allow ourselves this time to just literally rest in sleep, rest in prayer. So even on those times, think about when you felt like you were being dragged away. Who did you reach out to on the shore? Who did you reach out to in your own spirituality? Who did you reach out to? That was helping you cross over here and connect with that sense of felt safety. And this is yet another version created by um, a high school student at, um, I think she's actually at Lakota. I think she might actually be at Lakota. Um, Michaela Maidlow, she's a, um, artist, high school student of one of the gentlemen I work with. And what I love about what Michaela did is she connected our fear cascade with our hand brain. So the part of the hand brain we're getting to next is the cortex. And when it's online, we're, we safely flock. We're doing great. When it goes offline, we may unsafely flock, connect with unsafe people or become the unsafe people ourselves, or we may flee blindly. These are our kids that run out of school. They just run blindly out of school. I'll never forget, whoo, first time I got called in on a case like that. Wish I'd known this then. If you give them a place to run to, they will literally run to that place. So finding a safe place to run to puts the 
the cortex and the limbic system working together. We have all forms of aggression over here, which is your fear center completely in charge. But over here, when you're doing sports, your fear center is helping you overcome. And I love that she picked soccer because I could never play it because I was always too afraid of getting kicked in the shins. So my fear center took over and literally stopped me from playing the game. But for people who are brave enough to play soccer, that limbic system is driving you forward but your cortex is reminding you, this is just a sport. Even if you get kicked in the shins, you're gonna be okay. You're gonna survive. So your brain's working coordinated. And then down here, that freeze response, or am I gonna freeze this way? Both of require the brain stem to take a major role. But on this side, the rest of the brain is helping it out. And on this side is that faint response where the brain stem's completely in charge. But over here, the brain stem is mainly in charge, but the rest of the brain is still online and coordinated. So getting to that thinking brain, that cortex is in charge of all those executive function skills that get us labeled ADHD when they're offline, organizing, creating, problem solving, planning. And did you notice creativity is in here? So we're gonna talk about the importance of that. Um, this is sense with empathy and with compassion. And it's not fully formed to we're in our mid thirties. Frequently when I say that people go, oh, that explains so much about why I did this or that. So think about what your life was like in your early thirties, because this wasn't quite completely there yet. Some of us are still making some of those choices where you're like, what was I thinking? This part of the brain communicates through pictures and words. That means pictures have the passport from the cortex to the limbic system. Pictures have the passport. Pictures can get from the part of the brain we have conscious control over to the part of the brain we don't and help coordinate our whole brain, which is why we do so much with pictures. <clears throat> and we're gonna look at flipping our lid. When a stressor overwhelms this fear center, because all information enters through the brain stem and goes to the fear center. And the brain stem decides how much information gets in. If you're under stress, like we all are with COVID, or if you are on the autistic spectrum, or if you've had a lot of stress in your life, period, your brain stem opens up extra wide, lets in extra information because it doesn't know what it might need. This gives you all kinds of sensory issues. Do you ever notice how when you're hungry, you're crabbier than usual? That's because your brain stem has opened up extra wide to say, hey, Someone pay attention to me here, notice this hunger, but in so doing, all of your senses become heightened. So sounds get too loud. People look funny, lights get too bright. All of your senses get heightened when you get hungry. And I think um, hangry is something that uh, Snickers uses as a way to describe it. Literally, this is the, this is the neuroscience be behind hangry. So if you wanna bore your kids to death today, you can uh, give them a lecture when that, uh, Snickers commercial comes on. It takes our thinking brain offline. And so do all forms of stress. So one of the things we need to know about this um, pandemic is that it's causing all of us to be a little bit offline because we're under stress all day long because this pandemic just lays on top of everything we do. That's the bad news. The good news is, you remember that creativity I talked about? Well, research shows that when you Think about your purpose and what brought you to your purpose. It actually brings the thinking brain back online. So it can take, get you into the creative part of your brain instead of that fear part. <clears throat> yep. And we don't get to pick when our brain goes offline, by the way. And it causes that sensory overload. And I thank you, Bruce Perry. He says, when we feel safe, we can regulate. When we have safe connection, we can relate. And both of those things are needed before our thinking brain will come online and allow us to reason. Regulate, relate, reason. And so now we're gonna do an activity that's going to engage all of those parts of our brain. <clears throat> and I call it calming at your fingertips. So I'd like you to take a moment and just think of three strengths or three gratitudes you have, or maybe even a simple prayer that can get broken into three words or three small parts. 
Doesn't matter which one of these three things you choose. Just take a moment and choose one right now. I'm gonna give you an example. If, if I was Linda, who's helping me out today, the three strengths I would pick is, I am creative, I am organized, and I am kind. Creative, organized, kind. Those could be Linda's three words if I were Linda. So, um, Linda, those don't have to be your three words, but I was just using you as an example. They were very nice, Mary. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, so whatever you want your three words to be, get them ready. And now we're just going to say them to yourself and touch a finger to a thumb for each word. We're going to do that three times. After you've done it three times, just notice your breath. Cool thing about breath is you don't have to change it when you notice it. It changes itself. Now we're going to touch those three fingers together again and think of those words. And again, just notice your breath. So what we just did was we just coordinated your brain from head, from cortex, through limbic system, through brain stem to vagus nerve. And now going forward, you don't even have to remember the words. You just have to touch your fingers and you will be right back here into this place of an organized calm brain. Just touch your fingers. You don't even have to remember the words. I was doing this at the very beginning of the pandemic with a group called the Columbus Care Coalition. So they remind me a lot of the caring community collaboration. And um, there were some frontline workers there and we did a training and then a month later they were doing the trauma responsive care certification series. So a month later they came back for another training because you go and apply it for a month and then come back and let us know how it worked. So one of the gentlemen who was a frontline nurse, he goes, yeah, so you did the finger thing. And I was like, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard of. And he said, and then COVID hit and he said, I was so overwhelmed one day. He said, I'd seen more death in one day than I'd seen in my entire career. And I was like, I, I don't think I can put one foot in front of the other. And he said, so I, I, I took someone's COVID test and instead of sh sending it down the chute, I walked it down to the lab so I could just get off the floor for a minute. And he said, and I handed it over to them in the lab. And then I backed up against the wall. I slid down the wall and I noticed I was doing this. And he goes, so my cortex thought it was stupid but the lower parts of my brain called it out when I needed it most. And he said, and what I was saying was a prayer that my parents had taught me before I'd go to bed every night, which is not what I had used in your exercise. But it's amazing how the lower parts of my brain knew what to do to calm me, which allowed my cortex to come online and remember one of the most soothing gifts my parents gave me, which was this three word prayer that I could pray at night when I was afraid to go to sleep. So your cortex may think it's ridiculous, hang into that lower part of your brain. One of our foster parents taught this to one of her four-year-olds and it's, it's really, really helped him calm. It also gives the foster parent a cue like, oh, he's getting a little agitated. He's doing his little finger dance. She calls, he calls it the finger dance. And then they can do some breathing together. So Mary, I said, before, before we go on, let me, uh, yes. it's a comment, not a question. Okay. Chelsea notes in the chat box that it's really interesting about the creativity thing and stress and fear. And she said at the beginning of COVID, she started crafting with rocks and now she's turned that into a side, side job. She's selling little somethings at craft shows. Oh. And it came out of exactly that combination that you're talking about. Oh, that gives me chills. Thank you for sharing that. Was that Chelsea, did you say? Chelsea. Thank you, Chelsea, for sharing that. Oh my gosh, that's so beautiful. It's so interesting because the, we, ha, we have, a, actually our brain has a default mode network. Literally, that's what they call it because it's what we default to when we get bored and it's to worry. Our default mode network worries. Right. It's also our creative network. 
because our default mode network can only see the past and the future. It cannot be turned on when we're noticing things in the present moment. So they did research to say, how do we get the default mode network to default to creativity mm -hmm. instead of worry? Because if you think about worry, it's what happened to me that I want to protect from in the future. It's, it's a past future. When you think of creativity, what have I learned from my life that I want to turn into something new? They both exist in the past and the future. And they found that when someone noticed something in the present moment, and most importantly, when they noticed something that gave them a sense of purpose, their brain would then start to default to creativity or out of the worry network. So whenever you find yourself worrying, you just take a moment, notice the things around you. Gosh, where are the walls? Where are the windows? Where's my favorite color? And then what brings me here? What keeps me going? You can default to creativity instead of worry. So I just that they, they just released that research in the spring of 2020, which I thought was great timing for us in the midst of the pandemic. Almost think of it as nature's reset button. Oh, that's beautiful, Linda. Can I, can I quote you on that? I was having a creative moment. Please enjoy it. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh, I will, I will give you full credit. Nature's reset. I love it. That's exactly what it is. All right. So what a pandemic does is far more than kill people. Yes, it kills people and that's horrific and we're not making that a small thing at all. On top of that horrific thing, it disrupts the organization of our society because to keep ourselves from getting ill, we literally have to distance. And what is the first thing our fear center wants to do when it's afraid? It wants to flock. Stephen Porges, P-O-R-G-E-S, and you can um, probably Google him and find some of this talk online, has a wonderful talk called The Paradox of the Pandemic. And he talks about this paradox, how we're all, uh, the lower regions of our brain are screaming at us to connect with other people. And our cortex is screaming back. That's the most dangerous thing we can do. So one of the things we're going to look at today is how do we socially connect, but physically distant, distance, so we can calm both parts of the brain. And whenever we have chaos like this, it creates um, a response in all of our fear centers. And I say it makes us walking anger onions, sliding all over the fear cascade. So we've talked about the fear cascade. Now let's look at the anger onion. The anger onion um, is based on some research that comes out of Forbes, Forbes, Heather Forbes and um, Mr. Post, whose first name I always forget my apologies to Mr. Post. But they have a wonderful book called Beyond Consequences, Logic and Control. And in it, they break down many things, but most importantly, the neuroscience of that irritation and uncertainty sets off a fear response in all of us, whether we want it to or not. In the brain, irritation and uncertainty equals fear. So why does that happen? Because also it happens when we have sadness, we're gonna get anger first. Sadness can take our energy, which is why frequently when you are sad, you don't get out of bed. Fear can literally freeze you. So to protect you, your brain overrides these two and gives you anger. So anger and aggression literally is the outer layer of sadness and fear. Now, sometimes I work with people who live in very violent environments, very violent places. And they have said, and I learned this from LaShonda at Labors of Love, that even thinking about sadness and fear is dangerous. So she said, what could you think about that might be under the anger. And they came up with concern and worry. So if you're working with someone and the words sadness and fear freak them out, or they're just too um, limiting for someone who's in a really violent environment who has to be on their toes, then okay, what are some things that concern you? And what are some things that you worry about? So you can switch the language around, but the same thing is happening neurobiologically. In one of my trainings, um, Jennifer McKenzie asked, this is through the Columbus Care Coalition, she said, so how do we peel this anger onion? Where's the love onion that helps us peel it? And I'm like, I, I, 
I, I don't have a love onion. So she came back a month later with a love onion. And this is um, Jennifer McKenzie's love onion. She said, first, how about we approach with curiosity? Yes, we'll engage your thinking brain. How can this keep me, those I love, and those I serve safe? So whenever a new restriction comes out, I ask this question because it allows me to approach that new restriction with curiosity instead of with fury. And then when we approach the anger of the other person or even our own anger over a restriction or whatever is setting it off with curiosity, that allows us to connect and get some empathy. And with that empathy, we can then begin to explore, how can I help them feel safe? And as we explore how we can help them feel safe, often their sadness comes into view or our sadness. And when we connect with that sadness, including our sadness, that allows us to ask, how can I safely help those around me and myself feel less alone? And that feeling of being less alone is what calms our fear. Because at the center of our fear is disconnection. Connection is our greatest need as humans. Disconnection is our greatest fear. And that's been proven on a scientific level over and over again. So this is one way we can use um, Jennifer McKenzie's beautiful love onion to help peel our anger onion or the anger onion of someone that we serve. So I also then looked at COVID-19 and put it at, on the fear cascade. And this is where you can see where unsafe isn't bad and safe is good. Literally, when someone's feeling, there are some unsafe things we can do that our thinking, our brain may drive us to do. Like, I, I have a cousin who's a first responder and I have not seen him. I hadn't seen him um, from March until um, mid-December. And the only reason I got to see him in December is because he was, he's also a woodworker. So when he comes home from all of his stressful work as a first responder, as a firefighter and EMT, he does woodworking to let his stress out. And so he'd made some woodworking things as Christmas gifts for me. And we're going to meet in this large parking lot and exchange them. And he, you know, he's lecturing me, make sure you got your mask on, stay six feet away from him. Like, I got it, Brian. I got it. I got it. I got it. And sure enough, we pull in the parking lot, I open the door with no mask on, I run and I wrap my arms around him. <laughs> He's a very big man now. He used to be my little baby cousin. He just picks me up, puts me over there. His wife hands me a mask and he goes, you did exactly what I told you not to do. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. Yes, the lower regions of my brain took over and I just wanted to hug this person I miss so much. So it's, we can do unsafe things with the best of intentions. So remembering to wear our PPE, but also remembering that we are a gift to everyone we serve. We are a gift to this world. We too are the heroes and really remembering that. And then also noticing the heroes, the Brian's of the world. You know, um, we send cards to his um, fire department um, just so they can have something to come back from a run and look at. We love to send ridiculous cards because they get a big kick out of them. So going out in um, crowded places um, is an unsafe flea response. How could we take a walk maybe or tell someone that we need a break? Um, this is a great fight response. We see it a lot. Um, no one can tell me what to do or getting really short with others. Um, why should I have to follow the rules if the rules keep changing? I remember asking that question too. And then um, one of the women who uh, helped raise me sat me down, she was a doctor, she's 97 years old now, and she goes, it's changing because we're learning. Mary Ursula, which is what she calls me and she's upset with me. It's changing because we're learning, Mary Ursula. And when we learn something new, it is our responsibility to put that knowledge into action. And I was just like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> but I think of that and I hear her voice and I hear her call me Mary Ursula now and it just makes me stop and smile and laugh. It used to freeze me in my steps when I was a child, but now it makes me stop and laugh. So what can we do? Because yes, change is always happening. And someone noticed 
that by noticing that, that helps keep them going. Thank you for putting that in the chat. And when we can recognize that, change equals growth. Uncertainty equals growth. Um, finding a safe person that we can just share. This is difficult. I, I don't like this. Um, how can we make a new rule fun? I, James Corden did one called the shirt off shootout challenge. And if you can Google it, you will just crack up laughing, especially the one he does with, um, oh my gosh, what is the guy's name? Colin Curry, his last name's Curry. It's the first name Colin, um, who's a basketball star. So he and Mr. Curry are um, taking off, is, they put on many layers of clothes and take them off and they say who can get the most in the hamper and James Corden was only one behind this great basketball star and he said that made me feel so good and it's just hysterical to watch. So what fun things are you doing? Like my friends who couldn't get together for Christmas all got on Zoom and had a scavenger hunt which was ridiculous and so fun. And then now they're trying to figure out how can we have a scavenger hunt once we can get together again because they had so much fun with it. Um, our freeze response could be, yeah, this is no big deal. I, I, I don't have to worry about this. Um, but sadly, we do have to worry about it. Um, so what, what can we do to calm ourselves? One of the ladies in my investment club has started taking free dance classes. I think it's called uh, the World Ballet is offering free dance classes during COVID. Check out World Ballet. Um, and she's in her 90s and having a blast. So you don't have to be a ballet dancer. Um, I can't fix it, so I'm not even going to think about it. Well, sometimes we do need a break to not think about it, which is why I love my NCIS, because I can just think about what they're doing to make the world a better place by catching the criminals. But we still need to follow the orders and wear the masks so we can be physically safe. And um, what do we need to do to help ourselves deal with this frustration so we can get to that safe side? Any questions come up during all that? I just gave a lot to you all at once. No, there was just a comment a little bit earlier in the chat room that I think this all relates back to about, are we actually using that cascade in education? Which I think is a great question as um, educators to think about. Yes. And um, I think I gave you blank ones so you mm -hmm. could use them. So please feel free to make copies of whatever I sent you. Um, and if you need something else, just um, write me at mary at findinghopeconsulting.com. I get uh, like 100 emails a day, but I pay someone to read them three times a week. So just be patient. <laughs> someone will get back to you and we'll give you whatever you need. I'm teaching um, two courses at Xavier this summer for educators in their education department on how to use um, the fear cascade and some other resilience-based interventions in classrooms. Um, so we definitely have training on that and we're just trying to get the word out there. And I know Beth Race has done a lot to help us get the word out there through trainings. And thank you, Ms. Linda, by having me today so we can get the word out there about this uh, fear cascade. Absolutely. So our fear center wants to have something to see. And if it doesn't, it will create something or worse yet, it will direct our fear at those around us. So it's really important that we use the visuals, that we stop and do the breathing and stop and notice our surroundings and notice our purpose so we can get to the creative part of our default mode network. Otherwise that worry part will start blaming those around us. So when you're blaming people, know you're in the worry part of your default mode network, which doesn't mean people aren't responsible for their actions, but blame is, you notice when you're blaming, you're pushing away as opposed to when you're challenging. Ooh, what you just said was really hurtful. You may not have meant it that way. You may have had a different intention. Let me just share with you the impact it had on me. That's a challenge to invite someone to growth as opposed to, hey, I'm never speaking to this person again because they said blah, blah, blah. Now, sometimes there are people we need to maybe distance ourselves from. But what I'm saying is, how do you approach the situation with curiosity so you can figure out, is this a relationship I want to mend? And if it is, how do I invite the person to connect so we can do that? So just notice when you're blaming that you're afraid and what do you want to do with that fear? Think through it. 
And if you stop to think through it, your thinking brain will come back online. Get curious about it. That'll bring your thinking brain online. So here's one of the blank ones, but it is an invitation I'm giving you as a quick write to notice where are you on this fear cascade right now in this COVID pandemic? Where would you like to be? And how can you get there? And, and the clue to that is who can help you get there? Because we never get anywhere alone. It may feel like it, but even when we do something by ourselves, what we're doing, we learned from someone. Even if that someone isn't physically with us, what we learned from them or what we learned from our experiences with them, it, we're carrying forward. So where are you? Where would you like to be? And how might you get there? And who could help? And but I give you a couple of minutes to think on that. I want to note while you're doing that, that the link to Mary's course at Xavier that she just referenced about using this in education has been placed in the chat box. Oh. And Mary, there's a comment about uh, Nina thinks it's interesting that children visualize scary monsters when they're afraid. Yes, yes. And people with pre-verbal trauma memories often get diagnosed as schizophrenic or psychotic because their brain comes up with pictures for the feelings in their bodies. Yes, I was working with a gentleman yesterday um, who was struggling with that. And so what we did was we took the image of the monster that comes to him and I said, and I said, if you could do something fun with the monster, what would you like to do? And that kind of took him aback. And I said, Let, we can play with it. What, what would we like to do? And he said, I, I, I like to dance. I'd like to put on some rap music and dance with the monster. So we started playing around with things he could do to entertain the monster. Um, and they're hoping it'll help also with his nightmares. So we do the same thing with his nightmares, his nightmares so badly that literally what wakes him up is his heart pounding so hard that it pulls him out of sleep. And I said, what other things make your heart pound hard that you enjoy? And he loves basketball. So we started playing basketball with the monsters. And let me just say, he was crushing the monster on the basketball court. And that's- Good to hear. Good yeah. to hear. <laughs> something all of our brains can do. You don't have to be a child to do that. Um, someone described that and what's keeping them going by imagining the vacation they're going to take when this is over. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. That's what we're talking about. Use that imagination because your brain responds as if it's really happening. Absolutely. All right. I'm going to move forward. It's around a schedule. Working with instead of against our fear center. When our fear center is set off, it wants to resist. That's how you get into that freeze response sometimes. It makes you want to say no. Even if you don't want to say no, sometimes when you get a yes, no question and your fear center's online, it's going to say no. And that's its job. It's doing its job, which is to slow us down so we literally don't rush off the cliff of indecision. Unfortunately, at this time with COVID, we need to be able to change and adapt quickly because there's ever-changing new information that it's our responsibility to heed and do something with. Thank you, Dr. Ray Hartman. <laughs> so it helps our fear centers, to help our fear centers stay calm and coordinate with our thinking rational mind, it's in the best interest of all of us to just stop when we feel ourselves going, oh, I hate this. All right, let's just take some deep breaths. Let's count on our fingers. Let's notice what's around us. Let's get curious. What do I hate about this? That's one of the most helpful questions you can ask yourself or someone you work with. What do you hate about this? What would you like it to look like is your next question. Just like we did here. Where are you? Where would you like to be? And then let's break it down. How can I get there and who can walk with me? Or who can help me? When we're making decisions around COVID-19, these are some important questions to consider. And I, I was blessed to be able to work with many different groups working in congregate settings during this time. And so as we came up with ways to try and protect people, these are some of the questions we use to guide us. How do I connect this change directly with safety? 
literally. So in one of the settings, <clears throat> people had lived together um, as roommates for years and years, and they couldn't have two in a room anymore during COVID. So how are we going to connect the separation of their safe person with safety? So we had to work on that. Um, how best do I connect this change to safety? How am I making those affected feel safe enough to express how they feel about the needed change? So we all just sat down literally on the floor of their room, actually, um, I'm in there through Zoom, um, talking about how frustrating it is that the person that helps me feel safe at night has to be in a different room from me for, for a while, not forever. That's the other thing that helps our brain, knowing that it's for a while. What do we want to do in the meantime to feel connected? When you have a nightmare and John's not in the bed next to you, what do you want to do to deal with that? And so it was really great because um, the, the gentleman I'm calling John said to his friend, he goes, what do I say to you? You say, punch it in the nose. I'm trying to sleep over here. <laughs> and he goes, yes. So they made a little tape recording of John saying, punch it in the nose. I'm trying to sleep over here. So the gentleman would turn on his recording and listen to John say that to him and giggle and fall back to sleep. So these questions can help us get into that creative part. It can uh, be nature's reset for us. Thank you, Ms. Linda. And please remember, the less language someone has, the more they must use actions to show you how they feel. So at first glance, they said, oh, the people who have no language, they're the ones we're going to move because they can't complain. And I was like, oh, yes, they can. They're just not going to complain in words. What do they do to let you know they're upset? Oh, they destroy things. They punch people. They stab themselves. Yes. The people with the least language will have to use action. The people with the most language have the most ability to connect this with felt safety. So we actually ended up doing the reverse and working together on that. So these questions can help in a variety of settings identify the best way to help people adapt to the changes we need, even as we're sliding into home in this COVID pandemic, or I hope we are. So how do we deliver uh, information our fear center can hear. First, we want to lead with safety because it's going to calm the fear center. So that was the first two questions. How do we connect this with safety? Then we want to direct where to go with questions. That's number three. How can I help them feel safe enough, three and four, to express how they're feeling? And then um, we want to, so where can you go with questions? This keeps the fear center online. So we do not feel a drive to go outside the organization when concerned or confused. So when we were doing all the masking and things with um, some of the employees, we said, if you have questions, you can go to the following people, not just one person. And if they can't find the answer, they're going to tell you, I don't know the answer, but I'm going to ask and they're going to let you know who they're going to ask so that your brain knows what they're doing. I don't know the answer sets off a fear center, but while I don't know the answer right now, we literally gave them a script for this. While I don't know the answer right now, I'm gonna go check with Sue Smith and we're gonna figure this out. And if you have any thoughts or suggestions, feel free to let us know while we're figuring this out. So really calming to the fear brain. And then close with a gratitude. This releases oxytocin, which is the hormone that drives cooperation. <laughs> and it drives it whether you wanna cooperate or not. That's my favorite thing about oxytocin. So literally then the second half of their script was, and we know in the meantime, you're gonna, and they would name something they know that person likes to do. In the meantime, what would you like to do while we're figuring this out? So you have something to do while you're waiting. In the meantime, so literally then saying, and I know you're going to go do blah, blah, blah. In the meantime, you're going to keep people safe and you're going to do this thing we asked, even though you don't know why we're doing it. And we really appreciate you doing this thing that doesn't make sense to you until we can find out how it's keeping us safe. So literally paying it forward, saying, you know, they're going to do the thing you want them to do. Um, this was brought to me by um, the Columbus Care Coalition. 
And um, I, what I like about it is it's, it's not their work, the reference is down here, but they use it because sometimes in our attempts to be positive, we can actually be somewhat toxically positive. Um, so, you know, how many times have we said that, ah, you'll get over it, and we're trying to be encouraging, that's our intention. What does it feel like when someone says to you, ah, you'll get over it? Hmm, the in, their intent and the impact is very different. So just noticing, and what I love about this is they always give a translation of something that might sound better, that might actually calm our fear center. So I offer this to you, not to say, oh, look at us, we do these things wrong, but to say, oh, with the best of intentions, sometimes our brain shortcuts and we do these things. What if we considered these things instead? What would that feel like on the receiving end? And then Sarah Buffy, who's gonna train you this afternoon, I'm so excited. She's gonna be a great way to bring you out into the world with all this information. And one of the things she talks about is that external supports is anything that gives us a sense of felt safety. So when my uh, young man is playing basketball with the monster that he's afraid of, he's just created for himself an external support that he can carry with him. Um, when I work with teachers and they have a student um, frequently that other teachers struggle with, but they do really well in this teacher's class, but they steal from this teacher. What they're doing is they're bringing an external support of their safe place home with them. So if you can actually come up with a way to create something that they can have that you've made and you can have that they've made that stealing from people they like can go down dramatically. Um, and then another thing to consider is that our brain cannot truly say yes until it feels safe enough to say no. And right now we're in a situation where there's many things we cannot say no to because of the virus. So we have to connect more intentionally with our external support so we can have that gut feeling of safety. So where can I say yes in my life? I may not have power and control over wearing this mask or over not being able to hug my cousin, but by God, I can pick what kind of sweatpants I'm gonna to wear today. You know, whatever it is, what is it that you have power and control over? And just notice that and what's giving me a sense of safety right now. Okay, and some more external supports. Once again, prayers, meditation, yoga. Um, these you can find online, they're free. Um, this, I love these two. Kapasi Tar is developed by a woman named Patricia Kane, and she actually goes into disaster areas to help. And um, she, when she used to go in and do talk therapy, but she found that um, she would keep herself um, fresh and focused by doing some Paul Don Gum, I'm not sure I'm saying that correctly, between sessions and people were lined up in these disaster areas. Or at lunch break, she'd do some Tai Chi or some Kijong. And she noticed that as the people engaged in those activities with her, they got out of line for the talk therapy and came back every day for the physical activity. And so what I love about Capacitar is when you look it up, their emer emergency toolkit, they actually have photographs of the actual people who were in the disaster who showed her which of these were the most helpful for them personally. And then she took photographs of them and got permission and now they're online free for anyone to use. And I've used them in classrooms. They're really good for that after um, recess or after gym thing or first thing in the morning thing to calm kids down. Um, I've used them in group settings. You can just use them in a variety of ways. Sometimes I use them when I'm in bed and I can't get my brain to stop thinking. I get out of bed and I do some of this and then I can calm down. Rainbow dots are recording on colored paper, little round dots, um, acts of kindness that you did uh, that was done for you or that you witnessed. And um, sports and hobbies are another way as we know, to engage the creative default mode network instead of the worry default mode network. Reflect, honor, and connect is another intervention. And this works also well. And I don't think you have to pick an either or. This is another way to help support us with unpopular change. 
um, how can I make those affected feel safe enough to express how they feel? So if we don't have an outlet for our negative feelings, then we're going to act on them. So having an outlet doesn't mean we get to verbally abuse someone. So it's important to know what your limits are. And this is also one way that you can actually set those limits, but you also can use this when someone just shares with you their frustration. Um, so when someone's sharing with you how they feel about something they're frustrated with, or even just something they're really happy about, um, this works really well with spouses. Just, just give me a little heads up there. Um, reflect their strong feelings. So don't guess at the feeling, okay? Because when you get it right, that sets off the fear center. Did you ever have someone where you said, whoa, you're really angry, and they scream in your face, I'm not angry. <laughs> That's their fear center saying, I don't like this person outside me telling me I'm angry. So you just say, wow, you feel really strongly about this. You're having a big feeling about this. Um, this is really important to you. 101 ways to say, wow, this matters is what you're saying. Thank you for letting me know how strongly you feel about this or how important this is, how difficult this is, how much you hate this, whatever. So, and then offer, I'm wondering how we can get through this together. Just that word together, ah, thinking brain likes this. So what we know from neuroscience, thank you, Lou Cozzolino, in his book, The Neuroscience of Psychotherapy, that when we ref have someone reflect back to us what we've said, our brain gives us dopamine, strongest neurochemical in the brain. It's related to survival. It also heals the damage done from trauma or stress. So when someone's stressed and you reflect back, ooh, yeah, this is really important to you. Really helps their stress brain, get a little dopamine, gets them a little less stressed. When we honor, and this is also in Lou's book, um, please thank you, you're welcome. All of those lovely things your mama taught you to say, that you get something called oxytocin. That's the chemical that makes people wanna work cooperatively with you, even when they don't wanna work cooperatively with you. So um, thank them for letting you know how important this is. Now, frequently, um, people say, I'm not going to thank them for cussing at me. You're not thanking them for cussing at you. You're thanking them for letting you know that they're very upset. And then frequently in those situations, my connect is, and I really want to help with this, but I can help better when people aren't cussing. So maybe we can find another way to figure this out together. But I also know that when someone's cussing, three fingers are offline because that's scripted speech. Cussing is scripted speech. And that's the last part to leave before they go completely offline and act on their anger. Um, so once again, you can play around with this, reflect, honor, and how do I want to connect with that person so they don't feel alone in this moment. Even if you can't change it, how are we going to connect? And then this identifies those gut cues. This is a person in a mandala and it identifies what cues you get from your body when you start to experience stress. So if you don't have markers or things with you right now, you can do this later. But just think about when you're first noticing, or if you think about something about this pandemic that just irritates you, take a moment and notice where you feel it in your body. It's not a trick question. And there's no wrong answer. Truly, no wrong answer. Where do you feel it in your body? And if you could give that feeling a shape size or color, what might that be? What shape, size, or color that you would give them? So why are we doing this? One, because we just gave it a picture. Pictures have the passport. So when I think about not getting to hug the people I love, I get a twisting, tight green feeling in my chest. And it doesn't matter, like, why is it green? I have no idea why it's green, it doesn't matter. What matters is the picture, my twisting green feeling in my chest that I get when I can't hug the people I love. Ah, then I think about when I hug the people I love, what feeling am I getting? I get this, ah. I feel like I can breathe, like this opening up feeling, rainbow light coming out of my chest feeling as opposed to the intense twisting green feeling. 
So then I think, okay, what can help this intense twisting green feeling get one step closer to the rainbow light feeling? And even just thinking about the rainbow light feeling, I notice I change my posture. And in changing my posture, it certainly doesn't fix it, but it feels a lot better than it felt before. So this is something we can do with people of any age. I've, I've seen preschoolers do it. I've seen someone do it in Head Start. And in fact, the Head Start teacher, I love her. She's doing this with a little three-year-old and she's like, oh, you're having your big feeling. Show me on this picture, where are you having your big feeling? And the kid picked up a red crayon and put a line straight across the kid's face. And she goes, I think I did it wrong. We just got a line across the face. And I said, no, no, no. Now listen to this. Oh, it's your red line in the face feeling. And the three-year-old shaking her head. Yes. All right. And when you get to play with that toy, what does that feel like? And she took a blue line and put it across her face. Oh, you get the blue line in your face feeling. And she sat back and smiled. So it doesn't matter what it is. Whatever it is gives a picture to coordinate the rest of the brain. So then the Head Start teacher said, what do you want to do while you're waiting till you can get to the toy that gives you the blue line in the head feeling? And so they came up with something she could do while she was waiting, which by the way, is the number one thing research shows builds frustration tolerance in people of any age. What do you want to do while you're waiting? Yes. So I give you that. So um, I wonder if I... Ah, yes. So I'm going to give you a bunch of slides that have a bunch of words on it. I'm not going to read them to you right now. One, we don't have the time, but two, I put them in here for reference. So I'm just going to talk about the concept. And the concept I have on a diagram, because a diagram is a picture, and it works better for my brain, and it'll help your brain coordinate. But I just want to differentiate between primary stress and secondary stress. And one's not better or worse than the other. They're just two different kinds, but I want to highlight this. Primary stress is when you are at risk of exposure to the actual injury. So guess what? We're all under primary stress right now, unless you've had your two vaccines. And then you're only 95% not under primary stress. There's still 5% of you under primary stress of exposure. So that's one of the powers of COVID. Most of the time, we don't work under primary stress. You might work under secondary stress because you're all in the business of helping people who are under primary stress, which is stress that's impacting them. And then when they share it with you, because you have mirror neurons, which allow us to not guess at, but to actually feel other people's feelings, those mirror neurons kick in, and then you have a bit of a stress response. That's secondary stress. But right now, we need to give each other a little space because we're all under primary stress. Give each other a little grace. And reflecting, honoring, and connecting is a way to give that grace and remain in your thinking brain and invite whoever's with you that's stressed back into their thinking brain. And so I love this um, slide, which I got to work on with the Center for Family Safety and Healing at um, Nationwide Children's Hospital and Columbus Care Coalition. And it looks at, what I love about this, is it takes the research on compassion distress puts it on a continuum with the research on compassion satisfaction. Like what makes you feel good about the work you do? And then it ties it to the research on compassion resilience, how our compassion satisfaction actually gives us resilience. So what does it look like and what parts of the brain are we in? So when we're in distress, when we notice this is hard, this work we do is hard, yes. And we notice, why am I here? So I think of my friend, um, I'm gonna call him Tom, the nurse who was sitting there doing this. Ah, why am I here? Because I have a desire for help. Hmm. And guess what? One of the things he's doing now is advocating for different ways to work with nurses to support them when they're at work. So he literally, from noticing that he had a desire for help, found a way he could help those around him, not just the people he served, but the people he served with. Secondary traumatic stress is your cortex and your limbic system working together. 
Um, it gives us a sense of accomplishment when we're in compassion satisfaction. So if you find yourself over here, just stop and say, what have I accomplished? And it's gonna get you back here. And then if you want to take the next step, notice power with. Who have I had power with that I've empowered? It makes you the creator on the trauma triangle, lifting someone out of the victim role into the creator role, inviting them. And it takes you out of the rescuer role into the coach role, or it takes you out of the um, role where they're acting like you're a perpetrator into the role where you're inviting them to try something new. Because remember, imitations people can turn down. Vicarious trauma is the next level down when our limbic system is truly leading the way. And if we want to get out of that, we need a trauma-informed care mindset. Well, that's a big old fancy term. What does that mean? That means, how am I surviving this trauma? So the key from switching from being overwhelmed by trauma to growing from the traumatic experience is to ask, what am I doing to survive? Or what have I done to survive in the past? It literally moves the trauma off the lower regions of the brain into the cortex where you can actually work with it and learn from it, which doesn't mean the trauma itself is good because I'm not, I'm not talking about good or bad. I'm talking about safe and unsafe and how do we make ourselves more safe, more functional and actually do nature's reset and get into the creativity part of our brain instead of the worry part. And then how do I want to carry what I've done to survive and what I've seen others use for survival into the community and even challenging survival skills. So for example, we looked at um, suicidality as a survival skill that shows up uh, uh, on every part of the fear cascade. Guess what? When you are so trapped that the only thing you can do or the only thing you think you can do is hurt yourself, it takes courage to actually hurt yourself. So how about we engage with that courage because guess what? That courage is also what kept them alive till now. So engage with the courage that's hidden under the survival skill and pull that forward. And that's how you can get some compassion resilience. And finally, burnout is when you're in your brainstem and you know you're there because you're below your empathy center. So when you just don't care, and you don't care how it affects you, you don't care how it affects those around you, you've hit your brainstem because you're below your empathy center. That's when you need some self-care. What do you wish your life had been like when you were that age? What do you wish your life was like right now? If you could do anything to comfort yourself right now, what would you do to get yourself back into that empathy center? And then we're gonna look at those resilience factors that are gonna help us keep growing. So all of that stuff I just yammered at you are on these slides right here. So Mary, we've got about five minutes left. Just awesome. a heads up. Thank you. So then I changed the title here. These, these are the gifts of caring instead of just the costs of caring. All right. And um, a self-care invitation for you to consider is how might you use the values that brought you to this work? That's your beginning piece. How might you also consider those that keep you in this work? That's the middle, the right now and the moment piece. And what ones do you want to pass on to the next generation? And how are you already passing those on? So whenever you need to stop and find a beginning, a middle and an end, one of them lives inside of you. What brought you to this work? What keeps you in this work? And what do you want to pass on to the next generation? And then you can also put that into a body mandala. When you think of those three things, which also could be three things you put on your fingers, where do you feel that in your body? What shape, what size, what color is it? And this is how we can lead people along the cliffs of safety. So I'm not gonna read it all to you, but how can I help them feel safe enough to work with me? Um, and then here are some examples of how you can do it. So over here is the question, how can I help them find a safe place to go? And um, here are some ways to answer those questions on the other side. And then the five good things found in mutually enhancing relationships, zest, clarity, 
an increased sense of self-worth, creativity and productivity, and a desire for more connection. And here are some ways we can do them and stay physically distant, but socially connected. And I give you these as references, things you can look back on and figure out how do you want to do this. And then those resilience factors, I didn't forget them. I connected them to the five good things. So in parentheses are the resilience factors and below them are the definitions and how they tie with the five good things. So agency is the ability to be creative and productive. So when do I have power with is a way to engage our agency so that we have the power to accomplish our goals. Self-worth and self-esteem, very close, closely related. What are my personal preferences? That's your sense of self. It's a part of self-esteem. Another part of self-esteem is self-worth itself. When do I feel loved and valued? And then finally, when's my sense of self-efficacy? How do I affect change? Clarity can come from our external supports. Who are your supports? And how do you keep a sense of them with you when you're not physically with them? There's a way you do it. Notice that. Those kids that are robbing you blind, they're keeping a sense of you with them by taking stuff from your classroom home with them or from your play therapy room. And your desire for more connection will bring you affiliation. What groups am I connected to that help me get a sense of belonging, but I also help others have a sense of belonging? And finally, how do we get that zest? What safe, positive connection do we have? And we all need adult time. So who are the adults that give me that sense of safe, positive connection? Here's a grid where you can color it in and notice what relationships give you want what, because you're probably not gonna get all five of these things in one relationship. And um, all of this is important because whether we like it or not, we're all in here together. And I think Sarah will talk more about this because this is something I learned from her. First things first, when we honor each other, we actually, place belonging over managing. We cannot manage this crisis. We're doing the best we can. But when we can center belonging over managing, we can have the power with each other. So we have the power over this crisis. And once again, you can put that into a feeling. And um, let's see, how many minutes do I have left? Aha. Two. We got two. We got two. Awesome. All right. Another quick write that's got a beginning, a middle, and an end. And this, by the way, the beginning, middle, and end story work, um, LaShonda Sugg is really good at this. Um, who are your mentors? They were the beginning for you. How do they inspire you? How do you keep them alive and with you now? That's the middle. And how do you pass them on to others? So another way to do that. And I just want to close today on this soul nerve activity of a courageous ancestor. So I invite you to just get comfortable. You can leave your eyes open or closed. I just want you to go back in time and think of an ancestor. It may be someone you've never met, but there's an ancestor back there. Actually, there's many who had to have the courage to do things that kept them alive so you could be alive today. Let's just take a moment and notice what courageous things my, my ancestors have needed to do. Go as far back as you need to go. In every generation, there's courage that keeps us going. Feel free to invite those ancestors to the table with you. Honor them for their courage. Thank them for passing it on to you. Because the only thing stronger than intergenerational stress is intergenerational resilience. And that's what's gotten you here today. That's what you're passing on with those you love and through the work you do. So whenever you need a break, call those ancestors in because their courage lives in you. Thank you for the work you do and for inviting me here today. And as you're ready, just notice your breath and re-enter the room. 
Thank you so much for having me today. Mayor, I am just amazed at how fast two hours just flew past, Mary. <laughs> I think we could have easily kept going all day long and you've just been fabulous. Wow. I am walking away with so many personal insights and professional insights and just, I believe our audiences as well. And thank you so much for bringing your expertise to the table. It's been amazing. Okay, everybody, everybody give a golf clap to Mary. I know we can't hear you, but I'm sure that she will feel that positive energy coming through. Yeah. I do want to note a, a couple of things. We don't have time for questions, but I do want to note that um, your cost of caring, mm -hmm. that whole process with our teachers feeling a lot of burnout, that uh, there were several comments and questions about that might be a great tool to use with educators. Yes, that thank suggestion you. suggestion was made. And yeah. also want to note that Beth Reyes has made a comment in the chat box that if you'd like to learn more, learn more about these trainings, um, she has given information in the chat box. Oh, thank I'm you. To, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going and to make I, a suggestion. I will. Everyone go ahead and save your chat. You know how to do that in the chat box just so that you have all that great information in there. Mary, go ahead. Oh, I, I will um, get you that. Um, the cost and gifts of caring so you can Wonderful. share it and before I leave I'll try to put it into the chat actually I'm, I'm that would be it. terrific thank you so much Mary uh, just from the heart thank We're you about what a great interactive audience sorry I'm, I'm gonna shut up now but everyone was so interactive that's what brought this training to life it, it was terrific to all of our attendees and participants who made comments and added questions and shared insight and the amazing breadth of experience that we had in our in our audience today was really great to see. And I know that I can speak for the entire team, for our sponsors, and uh, again, want to say thank you to the Butler County Family and Children First Council, mm -hmm. and also to the Butler County Mental Health and Addiction Recovery Services Board for sponsoring us. And I know their hope and mine today was that, I'm going to use the words of one of our participants when she said why she was here today, and she said she wanted to make a difference and that if one life saved could then go on and impact millions of other lives. And I'm hoping that one life today is impacted by the work that we did and by Mary's amazing wisdom and words that she shared with us. We're going to close today on a final note and we're calling this a resiliency booster shot because we want you to walk away today thinking about, I do this work for a reason and um, we have somebody who's been impacted by the work that's going to speak to us. So I'll turn the floor over to Lori Brown. We will close on this session as soon as that's over. Thank you for being with us today. And please be sure to sign back in on the link that you were sent at noon for our next session. This is Lori Brown, Director of Student Services with Lakota Local School District. Thanks, Lori. Thanks, Linda, and great session, Mary. This is amazing. I have my notebook here writing a lot of things down as you were going on. Um, we thought it would be great as a planning team to end each one of our sessions with what we're calling, like Linda said, a, a booster shot of resiliency. So we kind of reached out and tried to find some stories of resiliency across the county. So at the end of each session, we'll be showing you, in some cases, a short video, and in some cases, a live person that will join us. Uh, but the first one is a, a, a young woman named Alexis, and I'm going to screen share and show a video of her talking about her journey through mental health and how she found uh, resilience and how she found what works for her. So as you're transitioning into lunch, we'll, we'll take a minute to watch this five minute video. Oops, there we go. Hi there, my name is Alexis and I am 26 years old. I originally started my partnership with NAMI through an internship that I had to have when I went to Miami University to get my bachelor's in social work. I really wanted to work in the mental health field and I figured what better place to start than NAMI. Um, I, the reason why I wanted to work in the mental health field and why I wanted to work with NAMI was because I myself was diagnosed with anxiety and depression a few years prior to that and I wanted to learn more about myself and I also wanted to learn how to better help others who were going through similar situations to mine. 
I have struggled with symptoms of my anxiety and depression for, gosh, probably 10, 15 years now. Um, it took me a few years to reach out for help because my parents, their generation wasn't so attuned to mental illness. It was kind of more of a, you know, pick yourself up by the bootstraps and get over it kind of thing. So anytime I was struggling or feeling really anxious or just really unhappy, my parents had a very hard time navigating that. And as did I, because I was, you know, 14, 15 years old. Um, I picked up that it might be a mental illness because it wasn't just a once in a while kind of thing. It was a daily occurrence. It was messing with my day-to-day -day life. I was, you know, getting really sick to my stomach. I was clenching my teeth and biting my nails. Um, a lot of the emotional things I was going through was manifesting into physical symptoms. And that's when I finally reached a point where it was either seek out help or I was going to drop out of school. And I was also having suicidal ideations. So that's kind of where I reached the point that I knew that I needed to seek out some tools to help me navigate myself better. Um, I actually ended up going to a doctor and therapist. I went to the therapist for a little bit. I kind of dropped off because life got in the way. Um, I was on antidepressants and I was on anti-anxiety medication, but I, I'm still to this day kind of trying to find the mix that works for me where the pros outweigh the cons. I had a lot of really bad side effects um, from those medications. And so I got off of them and did alternatives where I tried other coping skills such as, you know, I'm a really big painter, so when I was feeling really anxious, if it was at a time where I could control my emotions a little bit better, I would just draw or paint or try to focus on anything that I could um, aside from kind of what I was feeling or I would try to channel it into something else. And then if it was something really big where it was just overwhelming and all-consuming, I would try to ground myself. So I would think of, you know, five things I could see, five things I could smell, five things I could touch. Um, that kind of helped bring you back to reality a little bit when you feel like you're going through it and you can't swim out. Um, I have a really solid support system too, which has been a huge, huge blessing. Um, I have a lot of friends who maybe don't know so much about mental illness, but they're willing to learn and they're willing to learn with me, which I'm super grateful for. They're understanding on the days that, you know, I don't want to get out of bed or I don't answer my phone, which are a lot of days, um, even still, even with, you know, the tools that I have. I just think that with mental illness, it's, there's no cure. It is a day-to-day -day thing that you try to cope with and, you know, on a good day you get out of bed or you go to work, you brush your teeth, you make your bed, things like that. Um, they can be small steps like that or they can be big things like a job promotion or a new job. And, you know, I think another thing that helped me is when I was at one of my most anxious points, I decided that I was going to get a serving job. And it was really intimidating and really scary, but it actually made me kind of learn how to talk with people better. And when I was feeling really anxious, I kind of had to turn that off while I was at work, which helped me in my personal life because I was able to kind of keep things moving and let that anxiety subside a little bit. So for me, I would say, kind of facing it head on helped me a lot. And I know that's not for everybody. I, I was at a point where I felt like I was comfortable enough to do so, but there were days that, you know, I did miss work because it was just too much for me. So that still happens too. But um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like coping looks different for everybody and doing better looks different for everybody. Small or big steps. I, I would say my biggest coping mechanisms have absolutely been painting and have been my friend group, but I understand that when you are anxious and depressed, you might not have a friend group, and that's okay too. You can do other things. You can, you know, throw yourself into art or music or reading or different kinds of hobbies, and, you know, I also found myself looking online and seeing if I could find any groups of people who were interested in similar things, and I had a lot of online friends as well where I could communicate with them and friendships grew out of that too, so... Yeah. All right. So with that, um, we just wanted to share a, a quick personal story of resiliency. And I hope that uh, you can see some of the connections from what Alexis was talking about to some of the strategies Mary was talking about with trauma. Um, so I don't know, uh, Linda, if you wanted to say one more thing before we break for lunch or 
step. Thank you all for being with us today. We'll look forward to seeing you again in half an hour. Sign back in on the registration link that you were sent. And thank you again, Mary. Thank you. I'm still trying to get that in the chat. Should I just send it to you, Linda? Why don't you send it and I'll send it out, Mary. Okay, great. I'll do that. Thanks. You were terrific. Thank you. Oh, thanks for the opportunity. What a great group of people. Yeah, it was, it was wonderful. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for being so active with the chat and putting like the books and the references. I don't even know how you found the Xavier course, but go. So thank you. We have a great team. Yes, Mary, I, Mary, I've never seen so many thank yous in the chat. So very well done. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for your help. And so we could, it, it was so well coordinated. And I thank you to your whole team. Really wonderful. Now I'm going to shut up now so you can have your lunch. <laughs> thank you, Mary. And I'm sure we'll be in touch. Okay. We started our day off beautifully. Oh, thank wonderful. You. Bye, Mary. Bye. Bye bye. See and everybody in a few minutes. Out too. So you can have a great afternoon with Sarah. Thank you. And what I didn't get to say is sometimes when people talk about ACEs, they forget to talk about resilience. So just in case your ACE speaker doesn't mention resilience, some of us have like nine or all 10 of those ACEs, but we're in this room today because of resilience. So you never should to measure ACEs without resilience. And that's right out of the mouth of Vincent Folletti. So there's the, ba there's the balance we need to have. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. So, okay. I'm really shutting up now. Thank you.